Hi, everyone. Tonight, I wanted to uh, basically remind ourselves of some of the basics of uh, our walk in the Lord. I thought we'd start in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 12 to 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. This is an interesting passage of scripture which shows us that our relationship with God and our salvation is a two-way process, working in God, uh, working in tandem with God to make us more like him. You know, people say, Jesus changed my life, but, but how does that happen? Do we just wait on the Lord? Does he do a miracle? Do we just change? Um, and this scripture makes it clear it's a partnership with God. Verse 12 tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That, that sounds a bit ominous. Verse 13 tells us it's God who works in us. The working out bit is our responsibility and the God who works in you bit is his responsibility. Let me just clarify that a bit. Working out is not the same as working for. Uh, the Bible tells us we cannot earn our salvation by what we do. It's by God's grace, of course, his unmerited favor towards us. What Paul's talking about is using and developing the spirit we receive from God. Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, whose members had already received the Holy Spirit. He's saying to them, and, and by implication to us, to use what we've received, develop it, start growing spiritually. It's like when you work out physically, you try and develop the body you already have, make it stronger, more toned, get it into shape, not, not unlike my own body, not. <laughs> In verse 12, work out your own salvation means to accept personal responsibility for our own spiritual growth. Where it says with fear and trembling, by the way, it doesn't mean that we are be, we to be terrified. We don't need to be afraid of God. After all, he's our heavenly father. It means reverence. It means godly awe. It means respect. Taking our salvation seriously. I mean, it's a literally a matter of life and death. We're going to be spending eternity with Jesus. So isn't it worth taking seriously? Surely this is the most important thing we can be doing. Amen. Verse 13 for it is God which works in you. This is God's responsibility. That word works comes from a Greek word meaning energy or power. I mean, we know in Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said we would receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. It's the power of the spirit that motivates us and gives us the ability to change our lives for the better, to grow spiritually. So how does this happen? 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, and I've got the, uh, the New Living's translation uh, here. It says, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. That's saying we're becoming more like Jesus. Jesus' desire and goal for us as Spirit-filled men and women is that we change to be more like him. Remember back in Genesis 1.27, we were told that God made us in his image. But as we know, sin separated us from God. When we receive the Holy Spirit, he reconciles us back to God and allows that scripture to be fulfilled. But, uh, but that's not all. Wait, there's more. <laughs> there's, uh, we need clear direction. We need a guide to show us what to do. And I guess no prizes for guessing what that is. It's the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, again, New Living Translation, tells us that all scripture is inspired by God, is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. If we're serious about our salvation, the word of God needs to be a major part of our lives and not something we read now and again or at meetings, but rather every day. Joshua 1 and verse 8 tells us to study it, meditate upon it, and don't let it depart from our mouths. It's the key to a successful life, it says. I also suggest uh, uh, that people try and memorize parts of it as well. It's, it's a great skill to develop. Give it a try. The Bible will change our thinking, and it's our thoughts which drive our actions. Some people say, I wish I had more faith to deal with my problems. In Romans 10 and verse 17, it tells us so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It also tells us in Jude 20, again, well-known scriptures, but ye beloved, building you up your, yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. These scriptures are telling us if we want more faith, let's read our Bibles more and pray more. We'll experience a difference as our thinking becomes more closely aligned with God. Amen. So God is changing us by the Holy Spirit and the word of God if we let him. Remember I said it's a partnership here. 
Sometimes we find that God allows us to get into situations, problems, trials, so that through the trial, as we seek the Lord more, we increase our faith and grow spiritually, changing for the better. It's a bit like a refining fire that purifies us, getting rid of any impurities that hold us back and causing us to lean more heavily on the Lord. Proverbs 20 and verse 30. This time I'm using the, um, the good news translation. I don't use it much, but it, I think it brings out the meaning a little better here. It says, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. How true is that statement? There is no doubt about it. When you're in the midst of a problem or a trial, it focuses your mind and causes you to really start calling on the Lord. I mean, the reality is we can all be a bit slack at times and we only don't change until we are forced to or get desperate. We put up with things we know we should do something about, but it's not until we get really uncomfortable or in pain that we call upon the Lord. Is that a true statement or am I, am I the only one that's you know like that? <laughs> Hebrews 2 verses 10 and uh, 5 verses 18 tells us that Jesus learned obedience and was made perfect through suffering. How much more are we going to find ourselves going through periods of suffering in our lives so we can be, be made perfect also? Jesus went before us. He suffered the full gamut of human emotion and pain, loneliness, rejection, temptation, everything that you and I experience. We shouldn't feel unique or singled out when these things happen to us. We're in good company and Jesus knows how we feel and can truly comfort us if we seek him. In Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Where do our problems come from? Did I cause them myself through wrong choices? Are they from other people? Are they from the devil? Are they accidents? I mean, I'm sure we've all had similar thoughts and questions. You know, it's really irrelevant. This scripture is telling us that whatever the circumstances, God will use them for our ultimate good. Sometimes, however, that may not even be in this life while we're physically alive, and we might have to wait until we get up to heaven. Not everything is good. That's a reality. But God will use everything to work together for good for his purpose. What's his purpose? To make us more like Jesus. That's what the next verse in verse 29 of uh, Romans 8 is telling us conforming us to the image of Jesus. You know, there are going to be times when we will suffer like Jesus. Ultimately, though, the scriptures tell us we will triumph. And when we're sitting in eternity, we will appreciate the truth of that scripture. Other scriptures in Romans 8, such as verse 31, which says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 39, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Give us real comfort that God is in control. Amen. So I've gone through what God does in changing us. What about our side of the partnership? What is our role in working out our salvation? Is it, It's all about making right, godly choices. You know, spiritual growth is not automatic and we can't be passive. The starting point is in our minds. Here's a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If we're going to change our lives, we need to change our thinking. Ephesians 4, 23 and Romans 12, verse 2, both tell us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The way we think determines how we feel. The Bible word for change of mind is repentance. When we truly repent, we change our minds to be more godly focused, and that will motivate us to change our lives. It means filling our lives with good, wholesome things. It means being careful what we watch on TV or in videos or reading books. It means not engaging in activities that will grieve the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4 verse 8 gives us some great advice to meditate on whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of a good report. Hey, that would be the word of God. Hey, amen. There are so many or so much evil, negative things in our world which can catch us out or distract us if we're not careful. Colossians 3 verse 16 encourages us to let the word of God dwell in us richly. And as I mentioned earlier, that great verse in Joshua 1 verse 8 tells us that meditating upon the word of God is the secret to a successful life in the Lord. I mentioned earlier also about the power we receive when we receive the Holy Spirit and how it is the Holy Spirit that motivates us and gives us power to change our lives. How do we maintain that power? John 15 verses 4 to 5 tells us to abide in the vine, which of course is Jesus, and we are the branches. 
If we want to see spiritual fruit in our lives, we need to be closely connected to Jesus. When we do that, his power flows through us and we pr produce fruit. We change. Fruit comes from the inside. It's not stuck on like some Christmas tree decoration. If we're trying to be good in our own strength or doing works to appear godly, we're just faking it. We're wasting our time. Relax and let God's power produce his fruit in our lives. How? How about checking our prayer lives? You know, are we regularly seeking his guidance and wisdom each and every day? Do we pray about big decisions in our lives, even little ones? Are we praying about our relationships, our work, our home, our families, our brethren? In short, are we praying about everything? It keeps us grounded and focused spiritually. You know, we sell ourselves short spiritually if we only pray when we feel a need. Are we keeping Jesus regularly in our thoughts? That's truly walking in the spirit. God wants to be part of our whole life and all of our thoughts, not just on Sundays or when we happen to feel a need. But here's the thing. God is not going to force himself on us if we're not interested. We can't choose, by the way, what difficulty or trial will come across our path. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month, year or whenever. But we can choose what we do about it. Either we seek the Lord and allow him to make a way of escape or we can rely on our own efforts to, to overcome. Maybe we'll manage okay for a while on our own. But I guarantee you, someday you will need the Lord big time, especially when you're up your, to your armpits in alligators. That's not the time, by the way, to be developing our relationship with God. Do it now while there's time and allow him to change you and grow your faith. We are all a work in progress, aren't we? Amen. I mentioned fruit earlier. You know, one of the ways that God changes our lives is through the fruit of the spirit. We know we receive that fruit when we receive the spirit. Galatians 5 verses 22 to 23 lists about nine fruit that represent the, all of the characteristics of Jesus. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. How is that fruit manifested in our lives? By putting us in the exact opposite situation. For example, when you're in the midst of the people who are hard to love, that's how we grow the love of God in our life. I mean, it's easy to love lovely people, isn't it? Isn't that all our fellowship people? They're all lovely. But put us in a situation where they're unlovely people, that will really cause our love of God to grow. What about joy? Letting us experience some joyless, maybe tragic situations. What about peace? I mean, we can all feel peaceful looking at a beautiful sunset. But what about when you're in the midst of chaos? How do you develop long suffering? By letting us handle situations which will really try our patience. Think about it. How we react in different circumstances says a lot about who we really are and whether we need more working out of our salvation. So there you have it, working out and working through our salvation and growing spiritually. You know, it's a partnership that needs to be taken seriously and diligently. You know, God certainly holds up his side of the partnership. Are we going to honour ours? Amen? Amen. I'll leave it there, Ben.